Hi, I'm David Singleton. I'm one of the co-founders of LT Fluency along with Paul May. Welcome. Occasionally I will read the Gospels and come across a section that requires me to read it again for understanding. If I read it a second time and it still doesn't yield understanding, then I have to begin analyzing it more closely. The verses here fit this category for me because when I read them in my younger years, the first several times, grouped together, I couldn't seem to glean maximum understanding drawn from a smooth reading of them. I tell you the truth in verse 18, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. As I have delved into these verses' meanings over the years, I have come to realize that truth in verses can be hidden because of the way they are grouped together by the particular version of the Bible I am reading from. A stretch of verses grouped together should not seem disjunctive, and if they do, then something is amiss, either in the translation of the words themselves, a hidden part of the culture not made apparent in the translation of the words, a semantic difficulty, or a number of other reasons. In this particular case, the grouping of these verses together was part of the culprit. Of the ten most popular versions used in the U.S. over the last 50 years, three of them have two groupings for the above verses, verses 15 to 17, then 18 through 20. Five group all the verses together. The New Living Translation gives verse 18 separately from the other two sections, and the King James lists each separately as it does throughout the Gospels. This tells me that even the translating committees don't see eye to eye on how these verses should be understood. The difference in grouping was my first clue that these verses needed more investigation. I looked next at how Matthew is structured. The Gospels have a pattern in the way they are presented. Matthew's overall structure is to give parables, healings and miracles, and small teachings in little sections of their own, for the most part, although some chapters mix the different categories. For example, Matthew 5-7 through 7 gives the Sermon on the Mount, a section of individual teachings all in one place. Matthew 8 and 9 are comprised mainly with healings and other miracles. Matthew 12 contains a series of eight parables. And Matthew 19 shows Jesus elucidating scripture, then giving a parable. Matthew 18, our chapter under investigation here, gives a series of individual teachings. That helps me know to expect small little bits of unrelated or loosely related material. The next step in investigating the meaning of these verses is to look at the logic from one verse to the next to see if a teaching is related or unrelated. In verses 15 through 20, the cohesion between these verses breaks down in two or three places, forming non sequiturs. One can find cohesion in verses 15 through 17, but verse 18 has a different topic and seems like a non sequitur from verse 17. Verse 19 and verse 20 use the idea of two or three people, even though the topic is different in each of those two verses. Verse 18 can be seen as separate also because whoever is the subject of the verbs rather than the two or three. It also helps that the first words of verse 19 are truly again, discourse words that show that what follows is not connected to what came before, meaning that verse 18 is separate from verse 19. Lumping verses 19 and 20 together doesn't appear to be a good idea either since the focus of what the two or the two or three are doing is different. So there seem to be at least three logical breaks in this group of verses. 15 through 17, break, 18, break, 19, break, 20. Analyzing cohesion in this stretch of verses allows me to see a series of four ideas in a span of six verses that have been combined between the time of Jesus' speaking them and the time of Matthew writing them in a compendium of his life and teachings. After the discourse matters have been analyzed, translation of words can be reviewed. The ten popular American versions all translate the words as something that people on earth do that heaven will abide by. One would think, then, that the underlying Greek is clear in the idea embodied in the verse. 
However, the J.B. Phillips translation, a translation outside of these ten versions, captures a different nuance involved in the phrasing of the Greek that is overlooked in the others. Phillips' translation has a vintage of 1948, which means that nine of the ten versions ignored what Phillips offered since they were published after 1948. They decided on a translation that didn't carry the modern English equivalent of the Greek sentence structure that Phillips thought needed changing. English grammar would be really helpful at this point, but many people have little patience to work with grammar in a detailed setting. Like math, grammar depends on knowing how the layers of the smaller pieces combine to arrive at an accurate answer. Another way to put it is that the big picture gets lost in the details. Thus, what follows is the bottom line first, then a short explanation. An exegesis of this verse will be presented in a follow-up video, a part two to this video, to discuss the Greek grammar and the resulting English grammar in translation of this verse. If you want to see how the translation of the verse is derived, then you will want to watch part two because the translation below yields a polar opposite perspective and a different rendering than is shown in the 10 most popular versions. It's true. Whenever you deem something as right on the earth, it is something that will have been considered right in heaven already. And whenever you deem something as wrong on the earth, it is something that will have been considered wrong in heaven already. We can see that the difference lies in the perspective of this verse, the effects heaven and earth have on each other. The verse as translated by the major translations depicts that what happens on the earth is what will happen in heaven. Because of no context around the teaching at all, we can only try to find a logical link to other portions of Jesus' teaching. Nowhere does Jesus teach that any action of humans dictates a corresponding action of heaven. Thus, the usual rendering of binding and loosing or forbidding and permitting would be an anomaly with no segue from anywhere else in the New Testament. However, we do see teaching elsewhere in the Gospels that reflects that what happens on earth is what is happening or has happened in heaven, as translated above. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he teaches his twelve to pray. Your name is consecrated in heaven and now on earth. Your reign is established in heaven and now on earth. And your will is done in heaven and now on earth. Matthew 6, 9-10 Literally, the phrase is, as in heaven, so on earth. Matthew 11, 25 to 27 contains Jesus' prayer thanking God for revealing himself to those who are not so sophisticated in this world. Another instance of God's plan originating in heaven first, or as in heaven, so on earth. John 12, 44 through 50 quotes Jesus as saying that he teaches what he has been shown by the Father to teach. So, as seen in these three instances, if Jesus says that his, his teachings mirror the precepts of heaven, it stands to reason that Matthew 18.18 18 could be another iteration of earth mirroring the considerations of heaven, even if the apostles rather than Jesus would be making those considerations. This is laser-focused clear when Jesus told his twelve, that the Spirit who would come after he ascended would guide them into all truth. John 14, 16, and 17. Shortly after, he prayed, saying that he had given God's words to the ones God had given him. John 17, 7 through 8. As it had been planned out in heaven, it would be playing out on earth. Whether the modern translations use bind and loose or forbid and allow, the terms used are opposite actions. Finding real use cases in the New Testament of these words is not difficult. For the binding idea, Jesus uses what rabbis had taught regarding the interpretation of certain scriptures, as in the second half of Matthew 5, and he redirects what the rabbis had bound. In another instance, he meets resistance for his actions from the Pharisees when he walked through the grain field and decided to eat on the Sabbath, Mark 2, 23 through 28. 
He allowed what had been forbidden because he was the Lord of the Sabbath and because humanity was not created for the Sabbath, but the reverse. And even another example, Jesus condemns in the harshest of terms the effects of how rigidly Jewish leaders had chained converts, their own countrymen, and themselves with rules, as in Matthew 23, illustrating how they had missed the point. Jesus condemned their rules and freed them to follow God from their free will and from their hearts. Outside of the Gospels, in Acts 10, Peter is given a vision of clean and unclean animals in order to allow for Gentiles to receive the good news. This is a clear redaction of what established Judaism had taught about clean and unclean practices. And Paul tells the Christians at Colossae that the new life in Christ doesn't observe circumcision any longer. Chapter 2, verse 11, chapter 3, verse 11, or observe holidays with no Christian value, or worry about what to drink or eat, such as meat offered to idols or drinks used in libation ceremonies, or act humbly, which many would see as a sarcasm, meaning false humility. Chapter 2, verses 16 through 19. The New Living Translation interprets this last idea as living according to rules and translates it as, quote, pious self-denial, end of quote. Chapter 2, verse 18. Paul made a point to loosen what had been fastened. John, on the other hand, wanted to retract what had been done, or to deem something as wrong with the believers at Thyatira when he writes, or quotes Jesus as saying, that Jezebel had influenced people to eat meat offered to idols. Revelation 2, verse 20. He and Paul don't have to be at odds here. John just knows the culture of idol worship from this area of Asia Minor, where Greek gods held great sway among the inhabitants, likely ostracizing believers of Jesus from their social circles, including the marketplace where food was sold, and needed the believers not to blend in so that the believers would be distinct for not following the Greek pantheon of gods. Paul's audience was culturally different, more Roman, more about condescension than ostracism. Both men deemed something as right or wrong so that what was of heavenly origin could more clearly be seen against this backdrop of the two cultures. Now, as far as applying the teaching of Matthew 18, 18 as an isolated teaching to my daily walk with God is concerned, I take the idea that believing that Jesus was who he said he was is the mirror image of what is happening in heaven already. I take it also that daily walking with the one whom Jesus sent after he departed, the spirit who will lead me into truth in the culture I find myself, allows me to mirror God's nature here on earth. I don't have to depend on hitching or unhitching myself to tradition and doctrines. I can depend on the spirit of God's dynamic guidance from within and on the written record of truth of those who wrote for their first century cultures, guided by the same Spirit.